uh, I'm I'm really pleased, and I'm speaking to everybody now, not just Marcus, but uh, I'm really pleased to uh, introduce Marcus Hoodle, uh, who's at the Florida State University uh, campus there in Tallahassee, and has been there, in fact, since 2003, where he was appointed a professor. Before that, uh, he did his undergraduate work, I'm just reading from his CV here at the University of Göttingen in Germany, and then his graduate work at University of Kiel. He was uh, at the Max Planck Institute uh, for about 11 years at, uh, at the Institute for Marine Microbiology there, where he was a research uh, group leader. I didn't mention the fact that he also did a uh, postdoc at the University of South Florida, I think with uh, Gisela Goose, if I recall correctly, right, right, right. and uh, where he honed his skills on uh, boundary uh, conditions and boundary uh, transport processes uh, with Goose there, who's an expert on those uh, issues. And um, he's really as I mentioned in my note to everybody announcing this seminar, he's a, he's a internationally recognized expert on processes in uh, permeable sedimentary deposits uh, across the Earth's surface and on biogeochemical processes and on physical uh, transport processes in permeable deposits. And he has do, uh, been a critical uh, participant in developing technologies to investigate exchange of uh, solutes and fluids uh, through permeable deposits, in particular uh, eddy uh, covariance measurements, which he's worked closely with uh, Peter Berg at the University of Virginia on. So he's, he's, we're really uh, pleased to, to have him here as, as a leading expert in, in this area to uh, talk to us today about sandy beaches a class of permeable deposits as biocatalytic reactors. So, uh, Marcus, welcome, and uh, it's in your court here now. Thanks for coming. All right. Well, thank you very much, Bob, and uh, I'm, thank you for this very nice introduction, and specifically because you are so good in doing these boom louds, you know, gutting in and fiddle and so forth. So that is not standard. So is, I really appreciate that, although. Of course, this. Um, I also see Niels here. So, hi, Niels, long time no see. And welcome, all of you. And um, I'm very glad uh, to give this presentation. We all are uh, Zoom trained now. I wanted initially to make a little bit fun of you guys up there and say, okay, you are digging through the snow, but actually, the temperatures here in Tallahassee are the same as you have there. And you have a sunny day and we have a cloudy day. So, you're better off right now. So, now, I have a, a presentation about sandy beaches of biocatalytical reactors. Well, that's a little bit overused these days, but the main idea that I have and that I wanted to bring across is um, to, to give you uh, some, some reason uh, to understand why our beaches are still white, our sandy beaches. So if you take a vacation here at the Gulf of Mexico, you still see the sugar white beaches and that's not necessarily something that is um, uh, that, that, that we can expect these days. And I'll give you some idea why that is. But before I do this, I have to uh, acknowledge some collaborators that are very important in this research that I'm going to present. So Joel Koska and Kostas Konstantinidis from Georgia Tech have been uh, the leaders in, of course, the uh, microbial uh, data that I'm going to present and I have a whole bunch of students. I'm not going to read through all these names, but they have all been digging uh, like crazy in these beaches to recover uh, oil and other substances. And then I received nice funding from NSF and uh, Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. Now, beaches these days uh, have a hard time, at least in some areas here on the left. You see uh, the Copacabana, and uh, believe it or not, underneath this crowd, there's a beach. And uh, when this crowd leaves, you can imagine that it leaves some trash behind. Now, the picture on the right is not necessarily from that beach, but it's a common view 
unfortunately these days that we find a lot of human trash on beaches that is mixed with all kinds of things. And a new problem that is arising now that the beaches are a site where uh, sargassum, for instance, here in the Caribbean is a big problem. Uh, these macroalgae benefit from a nutrient and increase and also the warming. And in some tourist resorts, they now build these um, uh, things in the water so the, to, to protect the beaches because it's a, a real big problem. Now the sargassum belt it has been published, it stretches over the Atlantic and then collects in the Caribbean and piles up here on the beaches with a tendency to increase. And then we had the thing in the Olympics in 2008 where over had stopped some of the competitions, uh, the sailing and the rowing could not take place because these macroalgae would uh, be blocking the waterways. And then that of course also adds up, ends up on the beaches and the beaches have to deal with that. And it has been shown that these macroalgae, the ulva is increasing now over the years. And also the interesting thing is that um, these green tides, as they are called, they select for fast expanding over strain. So it's a feedback loop that appears to get worse. And we see it here also in our coast right now with the over picking up. One thing that is also a problem here in Florida, but elsewhere as well, specifically in the also in Baltic and plankton blooms here, cyanobacteria that uh, make the water almost viscous, more viscous, um, and uh, give it the oil-like uh, appearance. And that stuff is also pushed onto the beaches as seen here on the right. And you can tell that the beach already gets green. And some of these cyanobacteria, as we all know, are toxic and lead to this. This is not only anoxia or hypoxic conditions, it's also toxin from cyanobacteria that kills fish. And when you have this amount of fish sitting on the beach, you can imagine that the infusion of organic matter is substantial, unless somebody comes with a tractor and removes all this Manhattan that is loaded with wonderful fat. And uh, that of course uh, will add to the beach environment that typically is very low in organic carbon. I'm coming to that very soon. And then of course we have these instances. This is a very recent oil spill in Peru that was called by the Tonga undersea volcano where this tidal, uh, this tsunami, not tidal wave, the tsunami hit uh, a site where an oil tanker was loaded with oil. And that of course did not go so well and the oil ended up in the ocean. And that's what you see right now. It's an enormous pollution of oil. And we wonder how the beach, uh, how the beach are dealing with that. And so what triggered my interest um, was uh, the oil spill, of course, that we have here in the Gulf because my study sites were spilled. So I became an oil expert overnight, uh, volunteer oil expert. But what triggered my interest in the first place was also, we see all this, um, what happens to the beaches, all this organic matter loaded onto the beaches, macroalgae, microalgae, oil, trash and so forth. Nonetheless, they look like white beaches and you can go now to Florida beaches wherever you wanna go. Of course, they've been cleaned every morning. They, somebody removes uh, algae and, and plastic beakers and cigarette butts. But in general, if you look under the microscope, you see that there's hardly any organic matter in there, relatively speaking. Of course, if you put it in an element analyzer, you may find less than 1% of carbon in there, but it's relatively low. And then the question is, well, how come? How come there is input of organic matter from land and from the sea, beaches are white, how come? Doesn't make any sense. Well, some of that ends up subsurface. So the beaches are very good in pulling organic matter from the surface in. And I'm gonna give you another example very soon, but uh, the accretion of beaches here in the summer in Florida is substantial and can put a foot or two of sand onto the beaches that then in the following winters removed again and ended up ends up in the in the near shore and then it's put up back again in summer. So this is a cycle that allows organic matter to be buried relatively quickly. And here you see an organic layer of algae at about one and a half foot deep in the sediment. And then we had this experiment going on in the Gulf of Mexico uh, 
it's I call it an experiment here because it's a unique tracer experiment uh, that we then followed. Um, initially, of course, everybody was shocked. Uh, 11 people died and uh, it was going through the news that we never ever going to recover from that because this uh, enormous amount of oil that was discharged to the Gulf caused this to the beaches. So I went to the beaches here in June when that oil ended up on Pensacola beaches and it was terrible. Uh, you could hardly breathe because of all the fumes. And then at that time, the beach had developed a, a berm here along the water and a little trough. Um, the high tide pulled uh, the oil into this trough and then the temperatures were hovering around 100 degrees Fahrenheit and that boiled, not boiled, that heated up the oil that melted together to these puddles and that then caught also the ghost crabs and all the algae and so that in part of the beach formed these solid surfaces of oil. One month later I went to the beach and that's how it looked. Clean again. Of course, there was enormous cleaning effort, but it should be said that the cleaning effort could not be as effective at, as it could be because there were hurricanes passing at that time and tropical storms in a sequence of three storms in a row that prevented the cleaning. And you may have heard it in the news that they had to give up some cleaning operations. Nonetheless, the beach looked like that. And uh, to make an earlier point seen here, the beach basically took up the oil. So it migrated to deeper layers, the storm events and the, um, the movement of the sand uh, was dramatic during this time, during the summer. So about two feet of sand were deposited of the, on the initial layers of oil that were embedded in the beach. And if you dug down, you'd see that below the initial layer that was deposited that now is compressed, there's clean sand. And up here, it seems that sand is not dirty from the surface. If you look back here at the surface picture, it seems that it's clean, but actually it's not. There's a, the, all these sand grains are coated. Here's a, a comparison. This is the clean sand, this is the coated sand. But the coating was very thin. So by the authorities, this was considered being clean. But Actually, this, this, this type of sand would be clean, although here you had some dissolved oil components as well. But if you would take this oil and put it into the uh, analyzer, you would see that there was still a considerable amount of organic carbon in there. So we went ahead and did uh, a lot of sampling. So these are these trenches we dug. My students were uh, professional diggers at the end of the project. And uh, uh, well, they had reason to complain as well. But we take all these very large cores and took them back to the lab and then did environmental measurements to understand how this oil, under what circumstances, this organic matter is degraded in the beach. And there are some interesting aspects of Florida Beach. So, for instance, this, these are temperature measurements that we took over almost two years. And in summer, the heat of the surface is enormous. You cannot walk on these beaches, as you may know. But the temperatures um, over the year stay relatively high, the lowest in winter, about 12 degrees Celsius. But over long stretches of the year, we have this basically vertical uh, isolines of temperature that take the temperature, same temperature over the entire layer of the upper 50 centimeters, half meter of the sediment, which is a little puzzling because we have, of course, at the surface, very changing temperatures and also below uh, due to the groundwater effects and uh, moisture changes. So this was a little puzzling why this happens. But uh, an important message here is this is the response of the microbes to the temperature that we measured in the sand. So here's oxygen consumption as a measure for that microbial activity. And so the sweet spot here between 12 degrees Celsius and about 30, what we had here in the beach is exactly what these microbes loved and where they were most active, which is not unique to these oil degraders, but is uh, interesting in that respect because these beaches were relatively warm over the year as well um, as moisture was uh, suitable for microbial degradation. So if you go to a 
Florida beach in summer, you wonder how any moisture can persist in there. It's so hot, you cannot step on the sand. It's so porous, it's so permeable um, that you wonder how any moisture can remain in the sand. It should dry out from the top. We have these periods with no rain for weeks in the early summer when this happened in June and there was no rain for long periods, but still there was a tremendous, not tremendous, there were significant amounts of moisture in here and microbes are happy when they have about 2% moisture in the sand uh, taken from the literature. In the upper 10 centimeters, it may have been limiting. So Joel Costa and Costas Constantinidis has said they took these samples home and looked at the microbial community. And what happens is that you had initially, so this is before the oil spill June 8, and then about a one month after, you have initially an enormous bloom of microbes responding immediately to the oil input. So we have higher resolution data as well that show that actually one day is needed for the microbes to respond. And so we have the typical oil degraders in the beach, Alcaniborex, Marinobacter, uh, blooming instantly and uh, reaching one, at least uh, one, often two to three orders higher um, magnitude of uh, abundance in, in the uh, sediments. And then uh, that go, went on for quite some time until the fall. And then we have the deep cleaning. This is this gray bar. That was uh, what BP was doing at the beaches. And I'm gonna give you some detail on that. But the interesting part is that the gamma proteobacteria and alpha proteobacteria bloomed. The diversity was pushed back a little bit due to these um, large numbers of these two groups. But after that deep cleaning and after the oil had been degraded to a large extent, and we'll get into detail of that, the uh, microbial communities bounce back, especially also those microbes that have been depressed by the oil, and they came back readily. Now, to make a point uh, about the organic matter degradation in the beach, we try to get to rates. And this is taking these uh, sediment cores to the lab and, and embedding them and, and looking at uh, DIC production, oxygen consumption. And you can see where the oil was in these layers. You see um, more DIC being produced and more oxygen consumed. Going into the field, measuring oxygen reflect that basically, but you see that uh, there's not a large variability in the oxygen because the beach is relatively permeable. So it takes a lot of consumption to bring down that profile of uh, oxygen concentration in the beach. This is a logarithmic scale, but it shows you that from the initial several hundred milligrams of petroleum hydrocarbons per kilogram sand that was embedded in the beach, the background concentrations were reached already after a year. So after a year, all this coating of the oil on the sands and the fine particles of oil that were in the sands have been basically completely degraded. And I say basically because there are, of course, resins and asphaltines that stay behind, but this oil was high quality. It was a light crude, the deepwater horizon oil, so highly degradable, low concentration of asphaltines and resins. And they will be, uh, they are taken care of as well, and I'm going to explain how. In the middle, there was this deep cleaning event that did not do too much to all this, but I'm going to explain why that is. But the lymphatics and uh, aromatics and total hydrocarbons, they all decreased very rapidly at half-lives of um, 50 days to 70 days. So that was much faster than anticipated by anybody, but good news for this environment. We took advantage of our high magnetic field laboratory here at Florida State University and put that in these uh, fancy FDICR MS spectrometers with these super magnets that they have. They're proud of having the biggest on the planet. 
and that pulls apart the masses and can tell you uh, mass can resolve mass at a resolution of one electron basically and what it shows is that the initial oil the Macondo well oil had about 13,700 different components in this range of C20 to C100 if you use a positive ionization so to run these mass specs, you have to ionize the molecules, and then you, you shoot them through this enormous magnet that uh, pulls these pathways of the molecules apart in order to resolve the masses. And it shows you about 13,700 peaks. Our oil that we recovered at the beach had 32,000. And uh, so there's a three order a three factor of three in here that is explained if you look at the high resolution aspect from the microbes are oxidizing all these different components so they are not very picky apparently because the whole spectrum is affected it's not that it puts a gap in here somewhere it seems to be affecting the whole spectrum and if you look at the higher resolution you see that they add oxygen so they're oxidizing these compounds in some places they also add nitrogen or they degrade uh, uh, components that have some nitrogen in it making new components but the take-home message is they produce all these new components that again are food for other microbes in the beach so it's a food web that developed immediately around the oil involving a whole range of different microbes that could take advantage of all, the, all these different components. Now back to our oxygen profile in the beach. So I, I told you that these oil layers were reflected in the profile and then on December and June, we measured profiles again and I can tell you it's not pleasant to measure oxygen profiles in sand with microelectrodes or any device like that. You use a lot of them. But the profiles looked funny. So we had to measure a whole bunch of profiles to get to a, a, a reliable profile. And that's depicted in these arrow bars. But the profiles do not show a shape that we typically would anticipate was decreasing oxygen over depth. In contrast, they actually increased over depth and that gives us a, a, a headache why, why that could be. There's no source of oxygen down here. There's sinks definitely, but not sources. So how come? Well, the reason is the tide. So there's tidal level change of about two feet here in the Gulf of Mexico and the groundwater table in the beach goes up and down with these tides because the sediment is so permeable. Water can easily fly, uh, not fly, but go in and out. And uh, so as you imagine, if you have a water table that links up to the groundwater table that comes from land, it's forming a solid water surface within the sand that goes up and down. The gases in the beach have no other means as to respond with either being released from the beach or being sucked into the beach. And so that happens here. The sucking takes heat and oxygen into the beach and the up flowing water or the rising water pushes water uh, moisture into the upper layers and CO2 out of the beach. You can also call it just breathing. So it's like a diaphragm that is what we have in our chest going up and down and pushing uh, air in and out of this beach, which is a directed transport very different in its efficiency as compared to a random diffusive one. Now, as we dug our holes here in the beach and looked at our organic matter degradation in the beach or oil degradation, they came around uh, all the NOAA people and local authorities and were astonished by the deep occurrence of this oil uh, two feet down in sediment. And so they decided that they want to remove that oil as well because, well, I was asked, well, not, not only me, but uh, people were asked, well, is this toxic? Is it bad? Is, is crude oil bad? Well, the answer is, well, we have about 30,000 compounds in the beach. Some of them are really toxic. Some of them you can eat. 
So it's a wild mix and there's no straight answer to that, but there's certainly some bad components in there and you don't want you to have your toddler digging up the beach and then come with oily hands to the mama. That would be bad, bad advertisement for Florida beach. So they brought in these caterpillars and uh, they removed the upper two feet of the beach, put them in a sifter that you see in the background that is used for sifting gravel on uh, when you uh, build roads, for instance, and then the sifted sand was piled up here and redistributed on the beach. Now, when you look at these tar balls that I showed earlier, these layers, you can imagine that this is not rock hard stuff. So this is just fresh oil that came to the beach and was mixed with sand. So these things were brittle and soft. Now you put that into a sifter like that, that is pretty radical. It's two meshes that work against each other at a very high frequency, not very pleasant for the ghost crabs that ended up on there. And with respect to the tar balls, you can imagine what happens to those tar balls. They were just powderized. And then of course, the ones, the tar balls, we had tar balls in there that were bigger than an office printer. They were reduced to the size of a small potato and that was shown to the public to um, make sure that everybody understood how efficient this removal of oil is. Now, the beach looked after that like this, like a runway on Tallahassee International Airport and looked very clean unless you were digging a hole. And then you see very nicely that you have a layer that looks clean if you don't have a contrast, but it's not clean. It's just powderized oil. Down here, some reminiscent, uh, some leftovers of the initial oil layers, but that was about a foot thick layer of oiled sand. And you could take that into your hands and it would be sticky and compare it to the layer below that would just um, fall through your hands basically. So that was clearly contaminated. And then the question was, of course, well, is that better or is it much worse than before? Now with respect to having people in contact with oil, this is certainly worse. But if you, if you consider surface to volume ratio and how it affects microbial decomposition, this was certainly helpful to degrade the oil. Much more helpful than putting it through the sifter and then taking the leftover into a waste fill, a landfill where it's still not understood whether that is sealed towards the groundwater or not. So that's still open for discussion. But the oxygen profiles reflected what I just said. In this upper layer, we had enhanced oxygen consumption, which basically means that the, the uh, fractionation of that oil into small particles was helpful in increasing the degradation rates. Now to make my point uh, uh, made earlier clear to uh, the public and the scientific community that we have this beach breathing going on, we put out flux chambers, these uh, metallic cylinders are oxygen sensors, the little tubes take CO2 out of these chambers into an analyzer. And then we observed it over the tidal cycle no, we could not do that over a long time because it's a tourist beach and whatever contraption you build up there is frowned upon because people think uh, it's not safe. However, you see still the oil in the back. But, uh, so some of these chambers, I took some of the oil from back there and put it in there. So I did not add oil, I just transferred it. And some remained without the addition. And what you then see there is you follow the groundwater level which is increasing here from nine o'clock to one o'clock. It pumps air out of the beach and where oil was present, there was most more CO2 in there than where no oil was present. And there was less oxygen in the air that came out of the beach where oil was added than where no oil was present. So that was interesting in two ways. First of all, that you get such a clear signal and then that the degradation takes place at these very rapid paces. Now, rapid for oil. And it should be emphasized again that this is a very special oil. It's very, very degradable. And I said the 
earlier that the microbial community responded almost instantly. So there's a lot of components in that oil that are very, very labile for a microbe that has the enzymes that can degrade that. However, if you take now this CO2 and make it back of the envelope calculation, then for the oil that I added, these 0.4 grams per kilogram, or 190 grams per square meter of total petroleum hydrocarbons, it takes about 300 years to decompose that to CO2 if all would be decomposed. So it still takes a lot of time to get that done. To make the argument that the tidal pumping is heavily involved in the degradation, we built a tidal simulator in the lab, pretty simple device, um, two big troughs connected by peristaltic pump connected to a computer that pumps water back and forth between these troughs. Sediment cores sitting in these troughs, groundwater going up and down in these sediment cores. One oiled, one controlled, well, several oiled, several controlled. And you see the difference uh, with CO2 release and oxygen uptake. So pretty much what we saw in the beach. And then of course you can stop this thing and so what we did sequences with pumping, each peak here is a tidal cycle. And the, the blue bars here are with oil, the red bars without oil. And you see with the higher carbon dioxide production that it goes down where you have the oil. And then you can calculate a decay rate for both of those. And you can calculate the same decay rate if you just stop the tidal pumping for a couple of months. All this is pretty slow. So all this took uh, several years to accomplish. Um, needs a lot of patience and then stuff breaks down as here. But to make a long story short, the tidal pumping increased the decay rate by about a factor of 30. So this, uh, what we got here in the, in the lab is very close to what we measured in situ, uh, the half-life. But when we stopped, it was just extending that very dramatically. So that shows that this tidal pumping, oops, um, this is just my timer so that I do not run totally over time here. So now you have to show it. Um, that is actually not a, a result from your measurements, but that's actually have an effect on what's happening with organic carbon in the beach. And again, the oil is a great organic substrate for that because it's so refractory. So if oil degrades, anything else will do the same at a more rapid pace. And of course, I'm exaggerating here. There's certainly some woods that are as, as refractory as the oil is and even more. So what we did, we took a lot of these tar balls on the beach and again, did not add any oil to the beach, but just transferred that to these mesh balls and then attach two mesh balls at a specific height on this PVC stem and put 10 of these stems into the beach and then observe them over a period of three years. That is depicted here on the time axis. So three years and well, as you can tell, there's a very dramatic degradation of this for the alkane, so the straight change hydrocarbons and the aromatics, the cyclic components. And so there's definitely degradation going on. Interesting also that the decay rates are of course not the same in all the sediment layers. I mentioned at the beginning that moisture was an issue at the top. And then there was a sweet spot, so to speak, where temperature were highest and moisture sufficient. And then at the lower part here, you may have already some effects of less high temperatures and maybe also some inundation by groundwater once in a while. So that may have reduced this at the bottom. But there is a sweet spot here in the middle between 20 and 40 centimeter sediment where the beach is very effective in degrading the oil or other organic substrates. An interesting thing that we noted as well is we looked at that and said, well, how come that uh, we see this relatively rapid degradation? And then we also measured oxygen in these tar balls and it shows that uh, although they look very solid, they're actually permeable to some extent because the sand content is about 85% and the rest is oil. And so if you look under the microscope, 
you first see nothing, but then if you take a closer look and analyze these pictures, then all this white area is open space because the, the grains become pretty sticky. And so the matrix of the sand becomes more stable. It does not move as much as uh, the clean sand and that allows relatively large pores to persist over time. So sticking a microelectrode into one of these tar balls and waiting for months and longer did not reduce the oxygen in the core of these. There's some slight change. So you see a 2%, 2 percent, two and a half percent lower oxygen in the middle. But since it's degrading relatively slowly, the flow of diffusive flow of oxygen in there is sufficient to maintain relatively steady oxygen conditions in these small tar balls. Now, if you take something that's as big as an office printer, it may look differently in the, in the center. And so taking to this, uh, to, the, to the data evaluation, so this is what we see with the uh, saturated hydrocarbons over time, decreased over all the carbon numbers over the years, takes a long time to observe all that. And they can take these and model those. So again, this is a logarithmic scale and observed over years, in this case, over hundred years in the model. And what our data suggests is, so the background is about here, one to 2%. So this is about the numbers that I mentioned earlier, but if we look at clean sediment, it would take about 30 years to degrade this golf ball size tar balls or sediment oil agglomerates. So that is the time scales we look at. We take the same amount, the same tarball into the lab where there's no tidal pumping, but warm temperatures and moisture, then we triple that time. So it will take about hundred years. So that gives you an idea on how important this beach uh, pumping is for the degradation of organic carbon in the beach. Now, in order for you to recall all this very, 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 very important information, then you can, you can look at this in a very different way. You can look at the beach as being an organism, an enormous organism, because there are some interesting similarities. So it, first of all, whenever you put food on its plate, it takes it up, it buries it, so it takes it in, and it takes it in into the, its intestine. So because, well, if you look at that, the specific surface area of the sand can be compared to the microvilli that you have in your intestine. So you have a large surface area for microbes to live and to digest whatever you put in front of them. So they have to be attached and they really appreciate when you bring in this organic matter. Then the beaches, the tidal control of temperature and humidity maintains a warm, moist situation in this intestine like we do in our bodies. And then they breach. They inhale air with oxygen and exhale CO2 like we do. And that is important because as you know, uh, degradation products can inhibit the decomposition process. So if you remove the CO2, you certainly can, can accelerate that and the direct the transport of gases as said, much more efficient than the random. And then we have of course waste. When we go through the bathroom, the beach goes through the winter. So undigestible waste like the asphaltines that I mentioned or the resins, they are taken away by the winter storms that remove the upper layer of the beach. Now it ends up in the water that doesn't make them disappear. But then again, there are different pathways in the water possible for the oil and it is removed from the beach. Now, I should not stop without that mes message. Of course, we can overfeed that organism. And so if you can look at beaches near harbors and near very congested areas, you will see that these beaches get sick. And so they, the, the pumping is reduced. Uh, the microbial community can be affected by that. And so these beaches get sick. And then all this process that helps us to keep the beaches white. And now you have the answer that I asked at the beginning. Now those processes have limits. And we should be very well aware of that. 
when it comes to this. So here the question is, if you put so much stuff on somebody's plate, is that going to be something that is sustainable or not? And with that, I end my talk here and uh, welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Marcus. That was, that was really a wonderful and extremely clear presentation and the analogies you made uh, made it uh, make it quite easy to understand the balance of processes that uh, you're dealing with. It's really, uh, really insightful. So we'll open it up for questions now. I have some, but I'm going to hold back uh, so that others can uh, can go forward. Uh, David Black. Hi, thanks. I re really enjoyed your talk. It always amazed me just how quickly the beaches seem to have cleared up after the uh, Deepwater Horizon spill. The examples and the experiments you gave were appeared to be working on really well sorted, uh, almost what looked like 100% quartz. To what extent do you think the degradation process would change on a beach, say more like South Florida, where you've got a much higher carbonate content, much less cleanly sorted? Um, I would imagine permeability issues would, are gonna have an impact, but what about the sorting and chemistry? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, David. Um, that's of course true. When you change the permeability, then uh, you will change dramatically what can go on with respect to this pumping effect. Now, one thing that always fascinated me, and of course I acknowledge that if you go to uh, uh, beaches with carbonate sands of biogenic nature, you find a whole variety of different grains and different shapes and different sizes and so forth. However, and you may agree with that, if you go to a beach, you always, seem to have the same grain size. Now for non-expert, if you put that on the microscope and on the stereo lens and so forth, you of course will see differences and there's beaches with somewhat finer sand and, and beaches with somewhat coarser sand, but the hydrodynamic processes in the shallow sublittoral um, and uh, what you get from the Hultström diagram that predicts that uh, the grain size that is transported the most easiest is about 100 to 200 micrometer. And that's exactly what we find on our beaches. And so that is a function of what happens in the shallow sublateral. Well, all these transport processes go on under the wave of the motion and the currents that resuspend the sediments. And those who transports the most easiest are pushed up the beaches. So even though in the sublateral, uh, literal, it may look different, what ends up on the beaches, in most cases, is relatively well sorted. And although I certainly agree that the sorting is less, for instance, when I go to the beaches that I investigate in the Florida Keys, permeability is way up there. So I haven't seen a beach so far that is healthy and not permeable. I have seen beaches where abuse led to accumulation of all kinds of stuff in the pore space, including muds and fine particles that clog up the space. But even then, it's very difficult to stop the, the tidal pumping effect. There's enormous force there. There are examples in the literature that this tidal pumping, and I think, what was it, Singapore, I think, they have built runways, airplane, uh, airport runways on permeable carbonate sediment because they ran out of space, with the result that by sealing the surface, they blocked the pathway of this air that is pumped by the tides, and that was strong enough to lift up the runways and break them. So it's not, it's not an easy thing to stop that. So even if a contaminated beach is there, you will still have that effect. But what you get is channeling. So you block one area and you get most of the transports to a different area. So you get pockets where things can go bad 
and uh, because they are isolated from this from this pumping. Um, just as a side note, this pumping is uh, also very important for turtle nests here in Florida that benefit from the oxygenation of the nests and the temperature. Thank you. Great. Kamazima, you, I, you were next in line. Thank you very much. I, I enjoyed the talk. Uh, I'm going to go back to the winter condition when you said the winter, the beach uh, gets sick. And uh, one of the reasons you gave was you said the either the the the, the tidal pumping is is reduced or uh, kind of stops? Can you explain why, if it's driven by tide, why does it stop? Um, that may have been a misunderstanding. So it does not really stop. What happens in the winter is that at least in our accreting beaches here in the in in the uh, Gulf, this is not necessarily it's the same in dissipating beaches that I showed in my picture of the oil spill that happens due, due to the Tonga eruption. So there the, the situation is different on how it builds and decreases during winter, although it happens as well. But here in Florida, up to three feet of sand can be deposited during summer onto the beaches. And then in winter, typically that sand is removed back to the sublittoral, to, to the very shallow water. So when you have a pollution of the summer beach with the deposition of the oil that I showed, during the summer and the warm part of the year, that oil will be degraded within the beach. Not all of it can be degraded because there are asphaltines and resins that stay behind that take centuries to degrade. But then the winter removes this layer that still contains these asphaltines and resins and moves them back to the water. And then the water currents take that oil away and put it somewhere where we do not really know where it ends up. But in the Gulf of Mexico, we have underwater these enormous asphalt flows that uh, have made the news because they also have some uh, wonderful tube worm colonies on there and so forth. So that oil ends up, these asphaltines end up with those asphalts that are down there anyway. So that is a cleaning process that resets the beach on the annual base. Okay, thank you. Nils, you're next. Hey, Marcus, good to see you. Thank you very much for a fantastic talk. Uh, so for me, it's fascinating to think about a beach. And it's logical that with the water level going up and down, there is airflow that is induced by this tidal pumping. Um, and most of the work, if I, if I understood it correctly, you focused on the zone which mostly stays non-saturated, right? right? When there's a storm, it may be overflown with water, but mostly you look into the layer that is typically moist, but dry, not saturated. But right. I, assume, I assume below that, there is a layer where you have constant uh, immersion or, well, wetting when the groundwater is rising and then it's drying out or it's get, getting gas-filled pore space during low tide. And below you have a layer that is typically always saturated. Did you look, or what would, you, did you look at um, um, the, decomposition rates of these substances in these three different regions? No, uh, we proposed that, but that part of the project was not funded, unfortunately. Maybe we have a chance in the future. It's a very valid point, of course, but it, 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 it's very complex as well. So it needs basically the tripling of the research that we did in this project here. <clears throat> but, but, but would you, what, what would be your expectation? Would, would, there be, would, there, would there be one layer that is more efi efficient in degrading these substances? Well, I'll, tell, I'll tell you what I, what I think about that. So it's a very valid point. So you have one thing to consider is immediately that the uh, diffusive transport through pores of gases is about two orders of magnitude higher than diffusion in a liquid. So when you have oil embedded in water-saturated sediments, there is very quickly 
a deficiency of oxygen at the surface of that oil, even if it's embedded in sand. So we measured that because there's uh, in this uh, specific oil that we had here is very highly degradable. So it's like embedding a big amount of organic matter in the sediment. So we put that in a flume and put uh, planar optodes uh, next to it. And we could see that these halos develop right away around these oil agglomerates, even though we have advective poor water transport. So this is something that will slow down dramatically the oil degradation because there's this long time series up in Woods Hole where a, a barge ran onto a salt marsh delivering a lot of wonderful uh, fuel oil to the salt marsh where it was embedded in anoxic sediments or anaerobic, uh, let's say. And um, they've been going out for 30 years now to the site, uh, Chris Reddy and his companions looking at the oil and yeah, it's there, it's almost unchanged and it degrades at enormously slower rates as we find here in the beaches. So as soon as you take the oxygen away, and especially also up in Woods Hole where the temperatures are not as, uh, as high as here, you really reduce these degradation rates enormously. With respect to the interface between wet and dry, you may have actually uh, advantage. And I'm saying that because one thing that I did not dwell on too much in my talk is here that nutrients are also, of course, important for the degradation of the oil. Nutrients are limited in a dry sand because the nutrients are typically transported by the water phase. We have nutrients in the sand, but it needs moisture and the microbes are limited by nutrients in the sand. If you have the water coming in, the groundwater, the pore water that comes from the sea may have enhanced nutrients specifically when it first travels through sand that has been filtering a lot of nicely degradable planktonic organisms into the beach where they are also degraded. So the groundwater transport will carry nutrients deeper into the beach. And when these nutrients then are pushed further up by the pumping and coat the sediment, so to speak, and then the tide recedes and you have oxygen available where the nutrients now are and the oil, then you may have circumstances that are actually better than in the dry beach. Very cool. We need to talk more at some point. Yeah, Thank you. happy to, happy to, Niels. Malcolm, you're, you're next. Oh, thank you, Mark Kush, for a very interesting talk. We all love beaches. My question is about looking from the health of the earth planet itself and which is worse is it which is worse in terms of increasing ox, uh, atmospheric co2 or ocean acidification or whatever measure you want what is worse the the use of the of the oil in, to its intended destinations whether it be gasoline or diesel or jet fuel or heating oil or plastics or whatever um, versus the oil spill which is very acute um, and if the oil spills at sea you may have sinking of heavy fractions to the sea floor so looking from the planet's point of view which is worse i mean is, is the oil spill such a terribly bad thing no um, as mentioned at the beginning, at the start of the old spill, we all were shocked. And we thought, well, that's it. I thought, that's it for my career here. Um, I have to really change. It's not the case. And uh, there are some pretty dramatic examples that show that the spill is not really that bad. Now, putting that here on record is really bad for me, but I'd like to explain that. It's all on a relative scale, of course. Of course, it's bad. Of course, it's killed thousands of dolphins. Of course, it's very bad that we de deposited tons of oil in the deep sea by applying dispersant. And in deep sea, it's in the fridge. And there's little transport. And it sits there for centuries before it's fully degraded. So that is all very bad. Now, why do I say it's not that bad? Well. The environment is primed. And what I mean by that, there is the uh, about 600,000 tons of oil being naturally released in the oceans. 
in Santa Barbara, you may have heard about that in Gulf of Mexico, you see always these oil sheens on the surface. And there's a food web that developed around this oil. And that explains to some extent why the response in the Gulf of Mexico was really rapid with these, when you dig up a beach here, you take some of the sand home, you put oil into it, immediately the microbes respond. So there are a bunch of microbes that have adopted or evolved to make use of this very valuable energy source. It would be surprising if that would be not the case. We love the energy that's contained in oil. Nature loves the energy that's contained in oil. No energy source that you put out to nature, which is natural, and I underline that, will be left unused. So this oil is used very rapidly. Now, the big problem is the amount that you put in at a very specific time. You always can overwhelm a system and that's what these oil spills do. That's the negative effect that you overwhelm the response system like you do in the hypoxic zone in the Gulf where you overwhelm the system. That's why you have negative response. All the, the, the plankton bloom is not the problem. The nutrients are not the problem. The problem is too much at one time. And that's the same here with the sargassum that you see on the screen. So the oil spill was digested relatively quickly. And if we would not have done anything, it would have probably been the best. No dispersants no killing ghost crabs on the beach, just leaving it to nature would have been probably the most benign way to deal with that. There are other examples that are quite mind boggling. For instance, you may recall that during the Gulf War in 1991, the Iraqis and other nations opened the spigots and let oil out to prevent any attack from the ocean side, 1.2 million tons of oil were released to the environment that contained corals, sandy beaches. And you still can find some of the oil, but the corals took it very well, actually, relatively speaking. So um, it was anticipated that all the reefs would die. It did not. And many of these oil spills, the X talk that we had in the Gulf of Mexico that had similar magnitudes than the deep water horizon, but didn't get that publicity. There's hardly any publication out there, although the magnitude was similar. This and the water horizon actually made the fishery happy afterwards because the amount of shrimp and fish you could get out of the ocean was way higher than before. And that is not because the oil is nice food for organisms, although it's eaten by some of the, um, the microbes eat it, of course, and then there's food chain that's linked to the microbes. So it ends up in the food chain. But the main reason was the fishery is closed for some time. So the stock of fish in the Gulf recovered, uh, red snapper, for instance, shrimp. And after the fishery, uh, fishermen went out, uh, after the fisheries were reopened, they were astonished by the abundance of these creatures in, in the Gulf. So the system, the Gulf can handle a lot uh, with respect to these crude oils, especially when there are these light uh, crude oils that are typical for the, for the Gulf. And uh, so that is very degradable. It's a very different story if you have an Exxon Valdez spill in, in uh, Arctic environment where they have cobbled beaches where the oil sinks in and forms a layer of oil within the beach that cannot be aerated. And then the oil sits there forever. Oil coats the, the furry animals. Otters die by the thousands, uh, eliminated basically for a time. And the same applies to seals and so forth. So I don't want to play down the danger of an oil spill. I'm just saying, as long as it's natural, it has a different path as compared to plastics. And you put out some stuff where enzymes do not exist in abundance, although they exist. And then you have an oil product that will persist in an environment for a very extended time. And we see now the consequences. Thank you. Well, um, 
I don't see any other hands raised, at least not on my screen. And uh, I have some questions. I think you already answered at least part of them in answering Nils, because my questions concern priming effects uh, in the sense of interactions between labile organic matter introduced to the beach faces through processes that you described and oil uh, decomposition. But I'm going to hold back on that because we've, we're kind of running out of time here. And uh, so, and I'm, but I'm sure that you would have some wonderful answers uh, concerning priming processes in beaches. Um, I wanted to thank you again for your presentation. And uh, it's really a joy to listen to somebody who, who thinks so clearly and so knowledgeably about uh, topics and and you certainly do about all these processes associated with permeable sediments and I uh, and so it's, it's really a joy to listen to you and uh, with that I'm going to uh, close our formal proceedings I think uh, people can hang around I have a class as well uh, coming up so I'm going to have to leave but I think if you hang around perhaps uh, Others like Nils will uh, also <laughs> hang around and uh, chat with you. So uh, I'll let you determine when you want to close things up. I have to leave. And thanks again, Marcus. <laughs>